Welcome everybody. My name is Dan Carey and I'm the communications coordinator at Plastic Pollution Coalition. Thank you for joining our January webinar, Washed Up, the Invisible Threat of Plastic Microfibers. Plastic Pollution Coalition is a nonprofit communications and advocacy organization that collaborates with an expansive global audience of organizations, businesses, and individuals to create a more just, equitable, and regenerative world free of plastic pollution and its toxic impacts. And we'll go to our first poll question, which is, where are you joining us from today? So we see the overwhelming majority of you are joining us from North America, and we've got a lot of good representation from around the world as well. Let's move on to our second poll question. What best describes the sector in which you work? Fantastic, we have a lot of people from the nonprofit NGO space joining us. Also some from education, corporate business, government policy, media and film, research, and other. Thank you so much for participating. Poll question number three. How frequently do you take the fabric of your clothes into account when making a purchase? Great. It seems like the majority check frequently or take that into account frequently. That is great to hear. And then finally, the poll question I've been setting up since the beginning, what materials are the shirt are your shirts, coats, or tops that you are currently wearing made from? All right, great. Thank you so much for participating. It looks like cotton is the majority um, are the majority of tops and shirts are made from that, which is great. And of course, there are other fibers present, about 39% plastic materials, and spandex is also one of them with an additional 5%. It's all over the place, but thank you so much for participating in our polls. And now I will introduce our panelists and our moderator. Today, we're gonna to hear from Meli Hinesrosa, co-founder of Aya Eco Fashion and Arms of Andes, Dr. Andre Kirzen, chief scientist at Planet Care, and Dr. Judith Weiss, professor emerita of biological sciences at Rutgers University in Newark, New Jersey. First, I would like to introduce today's moderator, Madeline McGivore, Climate and Plastics Campaign Coordinator for Seeding Sovereignty. Madeline is a lifelong climate activist, microplastics-focused science communicator, and sustainable brand consultant. She holds an MS in Sustainability Management at Columbia University School of Professional Studies and a BA in Environmental Policy from Bernard having completed her undergraduate thesis on microplastic pollution at Columbia's renowned Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Welcome, Madeline. Hi, thank you so much. So excited to be here, everybody. I'm so excited to be moderating this, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about the issue and frame it for us all, because I know it's a little bit of an esoteric um, issue that helps to really get specific with um, the way that we think about it. So I first wanna talk about source. This is a really important graphic that many of us might have seen, you might not have seen it yet. And it is the sources of microplastics in the ocean um, and around the world. Because when we talk about fibers, we're also talking about fibers within microplastics, right? I think that um, it's so critical to think about how significant synthetic textiles are when we talk about microplastics as a whole. Synthetic textiles make up over one third of microplastics. So when we talk about microplastics and we think about the issue, we're really thinking about over one third of that is from textiles. So I wanna take a step back and really think about the source because again, micro, the, the title of this webinar is like the invisible you know, threat, right? Of microfibers. And we can, we can get visible, right? We can think about these little particles and really put images um, and facts uh, and people to this issue. So I, I just want to start off by saying, you know, 99% of plastics come from oil and gas. And so this is um, an oil refinery, um, and this is where plastics start out. So with that comes people, right? So I want to think about this issue from a social justice and really a public health standpoint. This is Sharon Levine. She is an amazing activist, Golden Prize winner, uh, and founder of an organization called Rise St. James. And she lives in a community 
in Louisiana in St. James Parish that is um, known as Cancer Alley. Some of us might have heard of this. Um, and she's been fighting a plastics plant in her community for many years. Uh, it's a Taiwanese plastics plant called Formosa. And her community is called Cancer Alley because of the high rates of cancer and unfortunately mortality that have been inflicted upon this community, mainly a community of color and low income community that has been located, basically this plant has been located on purpose right next to our community. Um, so when we think about the issue of fibers, uh, it's super important to talk about you know, solutions and sources, but it's also really important to talk about public health and social justice because this issue is so connected um, to extraction of fossil fuels. Okay, so when we think about the communities that are most impacted by microfibers, we can think about it from the standpoint of Sharon Levine and the extraction that happens to produce microfibers. But we can also think about it from the end, right, which is microfiber pollution in our bodies. So this is uh, a graph of microplastics found in bottled water. And unfortunately, bottled water, 93% of bottled water contains microplastics. Of course, over one third of that presumably being from fibers. Um, so I like to think about the intersectional ways that microplastics and microfibers impact our health. One of them being, for example, if Sharon and her community and other communities that are impacted by extraction have their sources of water, drinking water, polluted by um, whatever plastics refinery or you know oil and gas refineries next to them, they have to rely on bottled water. And when they rely on bottled water, they're now being exposed to, to higher levels of microplastics than someone who is does not have to rely on bottled water for their drinking water. I also want to highlight the workers around the world and people around the world, not just next to refineries or plastics plants, who are impacted by plastics. So these are workers at um, a really basically a, a huge landfill um, in Jakarta who are being exposed to toxic, you know, basically toxic compounds. Um, presumably a lot of what is here is clothing because we know that a lot of clothing is landfilled. Um, and so when we think about the issue and how critical actually individuals who deal with this waste are, uh, it's important to understand their rights uh, and their exposure as well. And I, I just wanna highlight that when we think about where this issue is going, um, this is a graph of projected cumulative petroleum production and millions of tons for plastics um, and how the oil and gas industry understanding that oil and gas is on the decline in terms of energy is planning to ramp up and it has already been ramping up plastic production. And so uh, it's, it doesn't sound very um, optimistic, but it is important to understand that the industry is aware of this um, and the ways that we can combat this. Uh, I just want to briefly end with just understanding that, you know, we'll talk about solutions for sure. I just didn't want to end on like a super <laughs> depressing note. Um, but, you know, this is a synergistic uh, approach. This is a process that just like there are so many sort of causes and intersectional harms of plastic and fibers, there are amazing intersectional and uh, really synergistic solutions. And I'm really excited to talk about all of those with you all today. And with that, I'm going to introduce our very first panelist, Dr. Judith Weiss. So Judith is a professor emerita of biological sciences at Rutgers University in Newark, New Jersey. She has published over 250 scientific papers, a technical book on marine pollution, and she's edited several other books. She's also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and was a science policy fellow with the US Senate and a Fulbright senior specialist in Indonesia. Welcome, Judith. Thank you very much. I'm gonna uh, start off talking a little bit more about what microplastics are and what they do. Uh, so they're defined as particles smaller than five millimeters. They come from various sources. Some are in a breakdown of larger plastic pieces. Uh, some are fibers, which we're gonna focus on. Uh, also tire wear and micro beads, the right-hand picture, the spheres used to be uh, common in facial scrubs and other personal care products. Uh, they're phased out in most of the world, so they're not a, a major player anymore. Uh, these small particles are eaten by plankton in the oceans, 
And they are also uh, a possible route for toxic chemicals to get into animals because toxic chemicals are within them and also attached to their outside. Um, they're found absolutely everywhere on the planet from the remotest mountaintops to the, the deep sea. Uh, we have to consider them a suite of contaminants and not a contaminant because they're very variable. They differ in shape. We have fibers, fragments, pellets, spheres, and so forth. They differ in color. They differ in the chemistry, the basic chemistry, the polymer that makes up the plastic, and they differ in size. Uh, they come from different places and they behave differently in the environment and have different effects. Uh, I will do this very quickly since uh, this was already said where they come from. The major, the biggest source is clothing and textiles. And, and as I said, microfibers are a type of microplastic found everywhere, including inside many animals and people. Uh, tire wear is generally the second most common type. Uh, so looking at where the microfibers from clothes come from, they mostly come off during washing in a washing machine, but they also are released to the air when you, you dry the clothes. Uh, and they also come off as you wear them and walk around. Uh, in the washing machine, they are too small to be trapped in the standard filters or caught in traps. They are filtered out most of them are generally over 90% by sewage treatment plants, but the remaining percentage is still a huge number. Uh, those that are filtered out in sewage treatment plants end up in the sludge or solid phase, which is sometimes applied to, uh, to the earth uh, and sometimes agricultural fields. So this is a way of moving these microparticles from the water into the land environment. And if it's an agricultural field, it's getting into our vegetables. Uh, in terms of the washing machine, it's been found that top loading machines release a lot more than front loading machines. Hot water releases more than cold water. The more detergent and fabric softeners release more also. So there's some tips that people who wash the clothes can use to uh, reduce the amount of microfibers. Uh, I mean, the, the uh, Diagram on the right, on the left is a sort of a cartoon showing the issue. You're washing the clothes, the fibers come off, the fibers then are going out into the water, fibers are then eaten by a fish, and then you eat the fish. So that's a sort of shorthand for how they get into us. Uh, the diagram on the right is just showing how different types of synthetics uh, will release different amounts. Um, so this is looking at the life cycle of clothing and that there's releasing microfibers from the start to the beginning, from the beginning to the end. From the textile production on the left, we are releasing microfibers into the air. Uh, as you wear them and use them, they're shed into the air. As you wash them, they're going into the wastewater uh, and the wastewater is going into the oceans or freshwater systems. And if they're going into the sludge after sewage treatment, they're then going into terrestrial environments. So, uh, and then you get to the end of the life when they're disposed of in uh, landfills, for example, we have more release to terrestrial systems. And all of this is having impacts on ecosystem health uh, and human health. Uh, animals eat them. And looking at the larval fish on the left, you see this is a fish in a laboratory that was given a bunch of those microspheres to uh, in the water and it ate them. And uh, so you're seeing this chain of, of little spheres running down its intestine. Uh, I want you to think about looking at them, looking at the middle picture, which is um, fragments with sharp edges, and the picture on the right hand, which is microfibers, thinking about which is more likely to go through the gut and out the other end without causing problems, which is more likely to damage tissues, and which is more likely to clog up the gut. And here we have the answer. I hope this is what how you your guess that the uh, beads are much more likely to go through and not accumulate. They're smooth and and 
round and would can easily get ingested. Fragments, less so, and fibers are much more likely to get tangled up and get sort of clogging up the digestive system. And the effects they have on damaging tissues and causing behavior differences and physiological differences and all the various effects they have, fibers tend to be the most severe in terms of effects. And, and finally, talking about the contaminants that are either in the plastic, part of the, what the plastic is, and also other chemicals that are in the water that can glom onto the outside of particles. Uh, the, the diagram is showing in red the chemical ingredients that are actually in the plastic. And the blue is representing environmental chemicals that can glom on and attach to the outside. And the issue is, um, one, how readily are these chemicals released into the intestine of, an, of animals? And, and that's a focus of a lot of research. Uh, I would also want to point out that the chemicals shown here are typical environmental chemicals, while microfibers from clothes have another whole set of chemicals like dyes and anti-wrinkle chemicals and others that are put into the fabric. Uh, and many of these chemicals, particularly dyes, are particularly toxic. And that's unique for the fibers and not for other kinds of plast microplastic. And another issue remaining uh, that people are studying is how much toxicity is due to the physical effect of the chemicals, of, of, of the microplastics, compared to the chemicals that are either coming off the outside or being uh, released from the inside of the plastic as it's inside the animal. So these are all uh, subjects of uh, intensive research. And, and I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Judith. So now I'm going to introduce our next panelist, Dr. Andre Krijan. Andre is the chief scientist at Planet Care, a company that makes filters for washing machines to prevent microfibers from entering waterways. Andre holds a doctorate in chemistry and has been working in academic research for over 25 years, focusing on the environmental aspects of polymers and plastics. And he's coordinated several international projects and is a lecturer for waste management and polymer materials at the university level. Welcome, Andre. Thank you very much. Thanks for this introduction and the opportunity to talk. I'm very happy to be here uh, at this uh, discussion, particularly on the fiber, since we live with fibers all the time and we um, actually deal with them every day. So let's start with a presentation. Uh, to start first, maybe uh, something about Planet Care. Uh, this is a startup that started in 2017, right at the end. And we had one goal to stop fibers coming from our washing. And we see the washing machine as the source, not the cause really, but actually the source and a really convenient choke point where you can really stop the fibers because it's not mixed with other stuff. So we made a concept filter and we were extremely naive at the first uh, you know, stage. We were thinking, oh, washing machine uh, producers will be really happy. There's a fiber and somebody is doing something and they'll you know, want to use it. Of course, that wasn't the case. Um, there are all sorts of answers um, actually, our comments, I would say, quite discouraging in some way, you know, saying that, well, it can't be done, there has to be a lot more research. Nobody wants this, particularly nobody's going to pay for this. So, so we kind of turned around our uh, approach and we went from B2B, still remained B2B, but moved over to B2C, B2C and said, okay, let's, let's see and let's show because we were getting, you know, questions from people like, is there a fiber? Can we get a fiber? You know, how do you install it? How does it work? And so on. So by the end of 2019, we put our uh, filter on the market. It's a retrofit filter. I'll show it. Uh, start selling it. We have more than 5,000 users right now around the world. Uh, then in 2020, we started um, a pretty important project for us to develop a filter that will be integrated into a domestic washing machine. Uh, we have partners and, well, our goal is to be market leaders uh, in this topic, we're, but we don't veer away from it. 
Of course, when you look at fibers and you know all the washing or let's say processing of uh, textiles, you see that, of course, there are several levels that need to be addressed. One is the home washing um, uh, machines, uh, very dispersed, a lot of them, small, relatively, let's say, small sources, but in every house, household. Then you have community laundries, or let's say maybe laundry rooms and apartment buildings and so on, much bigger machines, a bigger source uh, at one point, because these machines uh, really go through a lot of clothes and of course they shed a lot. Uh, and then of course, there's also the industrial setting. There's, um, I wouldn't say washing really going on, but there's a lot of processing in all sorts of tumblers and dye, dyers and so on, uh, where, where uh, fibers are shed in large quantities. So that's, that's a, it's a completely different kind of uh, uh, problem because of the scale. So I won't go into that, but we're trying to address all three. So where we are right now, I mentioned the retrofit external filter. This is how it looks. Actually, you would have it closed. It has a cartridge. It works on pretty much every machine. It's, it's relatively simple, I would say. You put it on the drain pipe and it passively uh, filters. Uh, the, the cartridge will get clogged, of course. It, it fills up and then you exchange it. And we have a... Um, uh, return and reuse um, sort of setup. So all of our users send their used cartridges back to us. We, uh, in, in a closed environment, we uh, open them, clean them. We use the durable parts and the part with the sort of filter medium and the fibers. You can see here this dirty stuff on the uh, left uh, open cartridge. You don't open it actually yourself. This is here just to show. Actually, that, that becomes waste. We can't reuse that. Um, the filter will capture between 80 and 90 percent of the uh, fibers, uh, and it's, it's really easy to install and use uh, product. And we will have a new model coming out this year. So maybe next slide on that. I think it's there. Yeah, it's here. So we're, you know, with 5,000 users, um, we've had a lot of feedback. It's, it's, it's really a lot of work for a small startup to start sending uh, filters around the world, you know. But, but as I said, you know, we're kind of forced to, and I'm very glad we did. Uh, we have a, you know, very courageous director who said like, nah, we're not gonna be stopped. We're gonna put this out and we're gonna show this is working. Um, and it's really very important to have a solution available because that's something important, you know, for the policymakers. Without a solution, you know, they can't really move ahead and, and mandate something or, you know, demand a change, even, even if there's pressure from the public. Uh, so the new uh, filter will be uh, improved so that you, uh, actually, the machine will never stop in mid-cycle. That was a problem that we had with the uh, current model. Then there will be an indicator that will tell you exactly when to change the cartridge. You'll have the possibility to bypass the cartridge if you're washing natural fibers and you don't want to filter those maybe. Um, although that's also an issue and maybe Judith will uh, say more about that. Or if you went to the beach or you were you know, working the garden and there's really a lot of dirt that is not microfibers, and you don't want to clog the uh, filter. It'll be much nicer looking, made of recycled plastics, and it'll have a new cartridge with a higher capacity and a higher efficiency. So I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, this will be mid this year uh, being launched, and we're working very hard right now to get there. Uh, something that um, I think really will be a game changer will be uh, filters inside washing machines. So uh, this will change the situation really because it, you know, you will buy a machine and it will already have the filter. It'll be integrated, it'll be automated in our case. Um, uh, so it's not gonna be depending on somebody deciding they would like to have a filter and install it and so on. This is a lot of work, you know, actually from really motivated and aware people and, and with the integrated filter, this will become available to everybody and go mainstream. So we're working on this filter. We have a really pretty much finished prototype, which is also in use with at least one major uh, OEM right now for a while with really good results. It's automated. So um, 
uh, it's powered as well because it's inside the machine. Uh, so you won't have to deal with it. You'll just have a slot actually where you'll, where you'll pick out the fibers um, uh, every couple of months. So it's gonna be somewhat similar to how the tumble dryer works and you take the fluff out. Here, it's not gonna be dry fluff uh, completely, but you will have to take it out only uh, once every several months. So um, you probably know that France um, uh, has a law that requires that machines will have such filters beginning of 2025. And that's what we're really aiming for and getting ready for. And we've actually seen that OEM, so washing machine producers, really are looking at that as well and starting to get ready. So it's far away from the situation in the beginning where they said like, well, look, we don't have to do it, so we won't do it. Now it's, it's turned and they're saying, well, we want to sell in France uh, in 2005 and forward. We have a commercial filter as well for the uh, larger machines. Uh, we have one that's cartridge based, but we're also working on a self-cleaning one. So we're trying to address this issue as well. Uh, and really there isn't anything uh, on the market on that level. Although uh, really this is a very, very big source. If you go into let's say large laundry uh, facilities, I mean, they go through tons and tons of clothes and there's really a lot of shedding. Like, for example, servicing, you know, the hospitality sector and so on. So we're trying to address that as well. Planet Care, you know, really functions as a, we're a company, of, we're a for-profit company, not making a profit, of course. So we're more like an NGO. So we really are um, very happy to work with partners, with policy, um, with media and so on. This is very important for us uh, also in terms of, you know, sales that people, you know, know that we exist. And we also support um, uh, activities to raise awareness. So we pretty much uh, love working with NGOs. Um, we've been lucky enough to be uh, highlighted by some mainstream media. And here you can see our director actually talking with the uh, French state secretary that spearheaded their law and they used this as a case study actually. So we're quite proud of that. And this is really an important sector for us. Planet Care are not filters. Uh, Planet Care is a team of really motivated people. Here you can see us. And we're, I hope we're, we will grow still and get more filters out. And I will stop with that and um, be ready for the Q&A. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much, Andre. So last but not least, I'd like to introduce our final panelist, Meli Hinostroza. Meli is an Los Angeles-born Peruvian who has worked to bridge the gap between her ancestors' heritage and the modern world by creating uniquely sustainable clothing made from the Inca's most functional fiber, alpaca wool, and the softest organic fiber, organic pima cotton. With her brother, Renzo, they built a studio in Peru developing plastic-free clothing through their company, Arms of Andes. Welcome, Meli. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, I'm Melly. I am co-founder of Arms of Andes and Aya Eco Fashion. Um, I opened up the two brands with my brother Renzo. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit my story, how the company started, the products, and our mission. So my parents are actually from the Andes part of Peru. They migrated to the U.S. in the 80s, and they had me my two brothers and my little sister. And we always kept a strong connection to our Peruvian roots. And we were really fortunate that my dad did business in Peru because that guided us in creating our clothing production company there. And we were actually even more fortunate that Peru actually has a big textile industry and also um, a history of natural dyeing textile, as you can see here. So Arms of Andes is an outdoor clothing brand made from 100% royal alpaca wool. And when we started making clothes for this brand years ago, we learned about the clothing supply chain. We were involved in every step from the fiber to the garment, uh, packaged and shipped to the consumer. And we realized some big issues with the clothing industry, especially in the supply chain. There was lots of plastic that was being used, lots of chemicals that were being added to the fabric. And we had no idea 
this these types of sustainable issues existed before. And so with that, we created another brand called Aya. And this brand is 100% plastic free. We don't have any plastics involved from the stitching that you use for the fabric to, to construct the garment, to the labels that have the washing instructions, to the elastic bands, everything is plastic free and free from synthetic fibers. Even the natural band is made from natural rubber and cotton. But we still felt like that wasn't enough. Um, taking plastics out of clothing is just the beginning of making a sustainable product. You still have the fabric finishings and all the other dyes. So we developed a new line in Aya that is free from dyes, free from fabric finishings and free from plastics. Essentially, this is the raw uh, cotton and it's the raw Pima cotton as well. Um, and so we wanted to give a new meaning to sustainability. We wanted to give a new definition of what real sustainable fashion is. And we felt like we're in this unique position where not only are we from the country that manufactures our products, but also the fiber is native from there too. Pima and alpaca wool are native to Peru. So we know the language, we know how to do business in Peru, and there's not many clothing brands that are actually even living in the country where their products are manufactured, even let alone, let alone even know the language. So we want to share as much knowledge as we have about the clothing industry, because as much as we want to sell to the entire world, it is not possible. <laughs> And I think to change the clothing industry, it needs to start with people. If people start asking for this, the demand, there's a new demand and then the supply will change. And that's what I think we need to push for. Um, so that's one of the big reasons why we started this chemical free collection. Uh, next slide. So um, a couple of things when trying to understand what you're looking at when you're purchasing clothes and how to purchase sustainable clothes. If, if you're wearing a t-shirt that says it's 100% cotton and the label on it in, indicates that, it usually means that just the fabric is 100% cotton. It doesn't talk about the threads. It doesn't talk about the labels, the buttons, the zippers, or any of that information. It's like, it's like reading uh, an ingredient list for a chicken sandwich and it's just saying chicken. It doesn't say bread, it doesn't say lettuce, it doesn't say anything else. And what's even worse is that you can't see other chemicals that are being used. For example, um, if the t-shirt is claiming to be flame retardant, um, odor resistant, antibacterial, and it's from cotton, that usually means chemicals are involved because cotton isn't any of those things. It actually absorbs uh, bacteria, so it does smell unless it's alpaca wool or merino wool. Those are the real heroes of the functional fibers. They are naturally odor resistant, anti-wrinkle, uh, temperature regulated. They, you also don't need to wash it because it's, yeah, antibacterial. And so with all of this information that we have about the clothing industry and the supply chain, we're always looking to share. We always want to share knowledge and we are also interviewing people that know more about these chemicals than we do. Uh, for example, we recently interviewed Dr. Vihak, who is the scientist that discovered microplastics in our blood. We also last week interviewed Dr. Shauna Swan, who um, did a study on the phthalates that affect our reproductive health. And all of this information that we're getting, we share it on our social media platforms. Um, so I do welcome everybody to follow us there. Um, in the end, we are a business, of course, we are looking, um, you know, to make profit, but it, it doesn't mean that we want to shut all the companies out and be the only ones. No, we want to be leaders. We want to change sustainability. We want to give a new meaning and we want to show people how to stop 
the greenwashing and how to essentially know what to ask for because I, I do believe that if people start asking for it, the demand will call for the supply to change and more manufacturers will start giving more information about what their clothes are made out of and what happens internally in the production that none of us really see anymore. And thank you. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much, Millie, for that. So now we're gonna open it up to questions. And it seems like the first one um, that folks have been posing is probably most directed at Andre, but um, also welcome Judith and Millie to also uh, to give, give a, an attempt as well. Um, what happens, so when, when the filter captures all these fibers, what happens with those fibers? Where do you put them? Don't they end up in landfill? No, 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 they don't end up in landfill. We're, we're not going for landfill and not incineration. We've decided to go for recycling. Although at the moment, the quantities that we receive back because each cartridge has approximately 25 uh, grams of this material, we don't have sufficient quantities to support a recycling process, but we have several uh, routes already open that are uh, really prepared and ready to go. One is chemical recycling. One is actually using the, um, uh, the waste inside the uh, concrete weights that are in the machine, which is kind of nice. You can put them in, back into the machine. Uh, but, you know, I'm, for example, just, just uh, a couple of days ago, I was talking with a designer that uses um, uh, waste uh, plastic, uh, textiles and non-wovens, and we're discussing that he would try to use this as well. Actually, we're still looking for some solution or some uh, outlet, you know, where the the uh, waste would be an added value with their story, really, because it's a an interesting story, sort of like you know, uh, marine litter and Adidas shoes with parlay for the oceans. Okay. Um, so in that similar vein, um, what is the cost of the filter for domestic washing machines? Assuming domestic, well, actually I'm not sure what where this person is, but the cost of the filter. Well, I assume it's in the in the states. I, I think it's approximately the we have several uh, different um, uh, sizes starter packs because you get a starter pack, and then then you can uh, exchange the cartridges, of course. So I think the smaller starter pack is uh, like 50, 40 or $50. I don't know how much exactly. I mean, just go to our site, uh, you know, plantcare.org uh, and we have our shop and, and you can get all the numbers there exactly, sorry. <laughs> okay, next question. Does recycling clothing and textiles make a difference? Uh, can I, <laughs> yeah, um, that's a complicated question to answer because it depends on what point of view you're looking at. Um, if you're looking at your health, there is microplastics that are released from recycled uh, polyester. Um, that's also in our interview with Dr. Bithack and he also had mentioned it as well. Recycled or not in the end, it's still a petroleum based product. Um, is it better than buying a item that's made from virgin polyester? Definitely, I would go for the recycled because you don't want to keep making it new again. But um, yeah, it, de it depends on what point of view you're looking at. Thank you, Melly. I'll also add that, yes, when we add recycled poly into the mix, that does not stop the shedding and the health impacts. There are technologies though that are exciting. One in particular comes to mind, it's called Ciclo, spelled C-I-C-L-O. And it's actually a technology that is um, added in the extrusion process, the creation of synthetic fibers that allows for the biodegradation of the fiber. Um, so their website is ciclotextiles.org and it's, it's something that's very interesting to look into. Um, yeah. And that, you know, there are so many synthetic fibers in our world that it's definitely um, a wonderful solution for those that just like can't be avoided. Yeah, that, sorry to add, but 
that was actually a worry we had as well because we saw a lot of people mixing recycled uh, polyester with natural fibers. So it was essentially ruining the beauty of nature, that biodegradability. Um, so it's interesting to know. Yeah. Okay. Here's if another. I can just add on the recycling issue, yes. uh, I think it's actually really positive to recycle, although you know not a lot of textiles are recycled. It's not that easy. Mm -hmm. And the segment of the recycling industry is not very well developed right now. But um, I think some studies have showed that um, recycled, so fibers made from recycled, for example, polyester don't shed significantly more or differently than just poly, uh, virgin polyester fibers. So something is it's not exactly recycling, but um, a lot of people tend to buy clothing and wear it a couple of times and then get rid of it is fast fashion, as it's called. Uh, and uh, I mean, people that are concerned about sustainability could get clothing at thrift shops and so forth getting secondhand. It's not recycled, but it's secondhand. And, uh, you know, that much more new clothing not being bought. Definitely. Great point. Exactly. Supporting the solutions in the companies like Melis that are doing the right thing and being exemplary and also at the same time reducing um, consumption. Um, okay, we'll stick with you, Judith. Are there, so, someone's asking, are there any known human health impacts from plastic microfibers? I would say, what are the known human health impacts of plastic microfibers? Well, what is known is derived from uh, tissue cultures, and experiments on uh, mice and rats and so forth. Uh, and uh, they found, you have to be careful because there have been in the experimental studies on animals, people tend to use very high doses that are really not realistic. And they find a whole slew of effects. Uh, and, and terrible effects, but that's not realistic and not using the kinds of levels that we're exposed to. So in a way, we're still somewhat in the dark about it. I mean, there are all sorts of effects that get seen on physiological effects, on biochemistry, on, on genetics, on behavior, on reproduction, on embryo development. But unless they're using realistic levels and using fibers from a lot of the experiments, people are still using the spheres. Uh, they're very easy to get. You buy them and you get a certain size and you can, you know, it's much easier to do with the spheres, which are not really relevant to, to the world that people are getting exposed to. It's fibers people need to be studying. And that's just revving up, you know, and, and there's still a lot of studies using spheres at huge concentrations, which I, I, I see these papers coming out all the time and I ignore them because they really have nothing to do with the real world. So I haven't answered your question, but that's... Um, actually, if I could add a little bit, um, when we interviewed Dr. Bithack about the microplastics that he found in our blood, um, I think he said 17% came from microfibers, but we also asked that question, how does it affect our health? And he also said, that's the study that needs to be done to actually figure that out. But he suspects um, one of the problems is that plastic carries bacteria. So then if it's found in your blood, essentially it's like a transportation of that bacteria that goes around your body. And that could be, um, yeah, it could have huge effects, but from what I remember, I think that's what he said. I think this pollution, you know, and the effects on us actually is really very interesting because we're talking of, of, about a very long time exposure at low concentrations. And then we have a synergy as well with other pollutants or other, you know, factors that are floating around. Uh, so, I mean, it's really very difficult to figure out the exact, you know, effects of, for example, fibers. This is really difficult studying. I, I admire the people doing it, actually. Yes. 
Yeah, I, I like to sort of liken this issue to um, like, there's no highly specified proof of harm yet, right? It's like, we can take these ingredients that might be toxic at certain levels, but there's no way of currently, right? Not enough funding or not enough time um, to be able to say X concentration of plastic in the lungs for 15 years causes X type of cancer that, that doesn't exist yet. Um, but we can put the pieces together and say, you know, there are reasons to believe and there's so much more reason to, to do more research and hopefully push governments to fund research. Um, but, okay, Ooh, Andre, were you gonna say but there, There's also actually a, a reverse, you know, question when people ask, you know, what are the effects? And we say pretty much, well, we don't know yet. But the other question is like, who would like to have plastic particles in their bodies? I mean, I certainly wouldn't, you know, given what we really do know about plastics. I don't want them in my body, body if I can avoid them. So, yes, totally. Great point. Okay, let's move on. We have time for probably a couple more questions. Um, this is a question for Melly. How are animals protected from harm in the manufacturing of clothes? I love this question. <laughs> um, so I'll explain it really briefly. Um, merino wool is, I guess you can say, the leader in natural functional fibers. And the merino sheep uh, originate from Spain, but they were exported to Australia and New Zealand. Those are the primary people that, uh, primary countries that shear the wool. Every farmer has about, I think, 10,000 animals. But in Peru, it's it's completely different. It's not industrialized in that. It's small farmers in the Andes that have these alpacas. And there's about 200 alpacas per farmer. So the alpacas are out grazing in the Andes. If you were to ever go to Peru, you would probably, and you go to the Andes, you'll find them there just grazing out. And so um, they work in co-ops and they're typically sheared by hand um, with yeah, some scissors and they're they're delicate. It's actually probably the most gentle shearing that an animal could get. Um, yeah, when when taking their wool. Wonderful. Um, okay, jumping around a little bit, but this is a question for Andre. Since chemical recycling is not considered environmentally acceptable, are you looking into discontinuing doing this? Oh. I mean, I don't know by what standard chemical recycling is not considered, uh, I mean, uh, acceptable. Uh, it, chemical recycling is a, a process in which you depolymerize a certain uh, polymer into monomers, and then you repolymerize it to make it pretty much virgin equivalent. So this is how, for example, uh, fishing nets are recycled uh, and stuff like that. And uh, a lot of polyester as well that could not be mechanically recycled directly. So uh, I think this is actually a pretty, pretty uh, okay technology and it's uh, being counted on to be used for a number of waste uh, streams that are actually difficult to recycle otherwise. Sorry, maybe right, right uh, in the comments, and I maybe I, I misunderstood something, but that's my view. Okay, and then we'll wrap up with a final question on policy. So um, I, I think anyone can feel free to answer this. I know Judith hasn't gotten as much airtime, um, but what we see, what do we always see as the role of policy to regulate emissions? Um, should the target be washing machines? Should they be clothing companies? Both, what is the approach politically? I think all of the above. And I think we need to, uh, there is a, a law been introduced in the US Congress. I forget the name of it, but it, it is um, extended producer responsibility where you put the onus on the plastic manufacturers instead of the you know the the lo local the local town or the people in terms of dealing with all the plastic waste it's the producer that needs to be um paying for that and responsible for that since the stuff they produce doesn't uh go away it's 
you know, all the plastic bottles and whatever have from 50 years ago are still hanging around somewhere in the ocean or landfills and so forth. So I think extended producer responsibility is the, um, the way to go. I think California uh, passed such a law. California is generally taking the lead in, in environmental policies in, in the US. And um, they may have passed a law on that already. I mean, it remains to be seen how this is done and how it turns out. But I mean, that, that will get at the root of the problem. In terms of microplastics in particular, I think the, the filters on the washing machine are an excellent way of reducing the impact uh, to, um, into the aquatic systems from, from closed washing. Um, the, the, the consumer needs to have a whole lot of education when they get a, wa a new washing machine in terms of, you know, the cartridge, if that's the, you know, sending it back and all that, that that's super important uh, for the consumers. And that includes the people who run the laundromats and the, the machines in the apartment building basements and so forth. Um, education is super important. And then there's also the clothes manufacturers that are working on techniques to manufacture clothes that shed less. And there's this research going on in the, you know, the standard clothing manufacturers. I know Patagonia company is very active and, and trying to figure out ways to make things that shed less in the first place. Uh, sorry, to add just a little, I do think it would be, I don't know much about politics, but I think if there was a policy to push clothing brands uh, to make it a requirement to have that, like that ingredient list that you would find like in the back of a food. So, you know, that says every ingredient that's on there and has all that nutritional fact, it would be really interesting if there was a policy that pushed all the clothing brands to essentially have that for their clothes, showed all the effects of the fabric finishing, what chemicals they came from, um, the zippers, because when you make, if you make a sweater, everything has a supply chain and everything has some type of plastic involved in their, the supply chain of making the garment, the zippers, the labels, the ink that you even find on your label has a supply chain. So I think with that, that can be great knowledge for everybody. And then, you know, people start asking more for a change. Great, thank you. Thank you both for answering. I wanna be mindful of time and hand it back to Dan. What a great Q&A session that was. Yeah, thank you so much to our panelists and moderator for joining us today and providing so much useful information and such a rich conversation. That was a really great webinar. An important note to our attendees that Plastic Pollution Coalition does not consider chemical recycling to be a solution. We support solutions that first and foremost work to stop plastic pollution at the source, and we will send more resources about this in our follow-up email. And pet owners, please mark your calendars for a very special webinar on February 16th, focusing on plastic and your pet's health. And if you haven't already, we invite you to join our global coalition. It's currently free to join as an individual business or nonprofit organization. Connect with us on social media to learn more about our work, and we will be sending out a follow-up survey and appreciate your feedback to help us improve. Thanks again to everyone for joining. Thanks to our Plastic Pollution Coalition member groups and partners who shared this webinar with their communities and networks, and we look forward to seeing you all back on February 16th for our special webinar focusing on pets. Thank you.